Ah, here we go. Okay. Welcome. Sorry for the late start. Okay. So what we're going to talk about today is something about the second parak in the Rambam and second parak of Shrena Paku. And what I did was, once again, I made a sheet with all the sources so that we can follow along on the screen. Everything is here. And the first source is the Parak Sheni. Parak Sheni, as we saw in the last year, reviews two things, teaches two things. It teaches us which parts of the human being participate in obedience or disobedience. And as we discussed in the last year, really what that means is which parts of the human being participate in being rational and become rational. So the parts of the human being, reminder, are five. The parts of the nefesh are five. There's the sikhli, the faculty of the intellect, the faculty of the zan, nedame, margish, and mizayr. Zan means nutritive, nedame means imaginative, margish means sensory, and mizayr means appetitive. So the human being is made up of five aspects. His intellect, his imagination, which we're going to talk about a lot today. His nutrition, which includes that he um, grows and uh, the vegetative kind of activities of the body. Um, the margish, that it has senses, feels things, and that Messiah, it has desires and disgusts, that it's um, attracted or turned away from things. Okay, those are the five aspects of the soul. And two of those, the Ramadan says, can become rational. Obviously, the Chilak HaSichli is Sichli. Um, that, okay, he talks about, we spoke about it last week, I'm not going to go into the, the details about that. But the two other aspects, two of the other four aspects can participate in being Sichli. And those are the Margish and the Mesayra. The Zun and the Medame are not so interesting for the purpose of Shemana Prakim. The purpose of Shemana Prakim is teaching us how a person can become wise and virtuous. And the Ramam says that the Zun and the Medame don't become wise. The mind doesn't control your nutritive faculty, nor does it control your imagination. And Ram says that it's important to think about the fact that those operate when a person's asleep as well. Shnei elu achalokim act during sleep and therefore they're not part of the um person's rational control okay and then furthermore the ram says when we talk about the milus of a person the virtues of a person so there are two kinds of virtues there are moral virtues and intellectual virtues intellectual virtues are the ones that are in the of the soul and those are to be wise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The moral virtues are in the appetitive and in the sensitive faculty, which aids the appetite. In other words, someone who's virtuous, morally virtuous, will desire the right things and be aided in that desire by his senses. Okay, so that's what Ram says. So if we talk about what makes a person virtuous, what makes a person a good person, a virtuous person, there are two things we can talk about. A person becomes virtuous because he has chachma, and he becomes virtuous because he has good midas. Those midas are in the misoyer and the margish, not in the zon and the madama. And what I want to talk about today is a very specific question. The question is as follows. The question is, why does the Ramam insist that the human being's milus, the virtues, are only in the chilek asichli, the misayr, the margish, but not in the zan or the madana? So the zan, we know why. It's very clear why. He says why. Because the zan is not something that we say the person has a milah. The person might be healthy, so therefore, his chilek azan operates properly. And then another person might be ill in that his nutritive faculty doesn't work well. But the question is that when it comes to his imagination, why wouldn't that be considered a mile? So why is it considered a mile if a person's 
Zun works well, as we discussed last week. Why isn't it considered a Milo? Because it has nothing to do with the fact that he's a human being. This is how Aristotle defines it, trumping ahead over here a little bit. The excellence of this faculty, I think he's talking about the Zun. We'll see. Um, appears to be common to all animate things and not peculiar to man. So therefore, he's not going to talk about this subject. Yeah, the nutritive part of the soul, since it exhibits no specifically human excellence. In other words, when we talk about a Milo, for the purposes of, of the discussion of Shemar Prakim, we want to know what does it mean for someone to be excellent as a human? So yes, it's important that your Chilik Azan works. And if your Chilik Azan is not working, you should go see a doctor. But that's not the same subject matter as teaching a person how to improve or perfect his Chilik Hamas Ayra. Why? Because the Chilik Hamas Ayra, if you perfect that, then you're excellent as a human being. Because you're doing uniquely human, uniquely um, things which have a uniquely human excellence. If we could train your Kareh to be virtuous, then you're going to want what's true. You're not going to want what's wrong. And that's a specifically human quality. So therefore, that's what we call a Milo. But perfecting your Chilik Hazan is not going to give you any particularly human excellence. Okay? So far, so good? Is that a question, Marshall? Okay, go ahead. An animal can perfect his chelik hazon by going, I mean... By going to a vet, yes. His chelik hazon. What? By doing what? By going to a doctor. Right, exactly. So what? Uh, but an animal can't perfect his chelik hazon. Oh, the animal can also go to a doctor. Okay. No, right. but the point is, if... No, the point is like this. It's not about whether you could or can't fix it. The point is, if your chelik hazon is perfected, you have an excellence which is something that an animal can also have. Whether the animal, whether it's an animal's control or not, and the animal can do anything about it, that's not, that's not what concerns us. What concerns us is, can you point to someone and say, oh, that's a special person. Why is he special? Because uh, his digestive system works very well. I'm like, okay, yeah, it's very important. Or he grows well, his body works well, his physical body. Yeah, it's talking very important. No one's minimizing the importance. And you need to, if you have a problem with that, go to the doctor. But you won't say that's a special person. Al-Farabi says the same thing. Remember, Al-Farabi is one of the, the source, really, for a lot, for a lot of the Shemitah Park. I mean, he says, ch -ch 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 -ch. certain things are not called virtues because those actions are those which a human being is praised or blamed. Whereas a human being is not praised or blamed for others. So when we say Milo, when we say, oh, Milo, it means something special about him, something to praise, right? You praise a person for what's special for him as a person. We don't praise people for what's special for them that they share with animals. Okay, I'm not going to say as an animal, because that's what we learned in Perak Aleph, that a human being is not an animal plus a person. But the aspect of the human being that he shares with animals is not the aspect for which we praise him. And that tells us something. That tells us that that's not something which is uniquely human. And we, as humans, are impressed by and think about and should think about mainly what's uniquely human. So therefore, we want to talk about um, being kind, being brave, being all the being temperate, all the all the minus hamidis that Ram describes. The question is, when it comes to the medame, it's there's a big problem over here. Now, what is the medame? Well, we're going to look into this a little bit more soon. But the medame basically means imagination, which means the way the Ram defines it. You see things, okay? That's part of the helik hamargish. That's the sensory aspect of the soul. Those things that you see imprint themselves on your mind. You retain in your mind images of things that you've seen. And the Chilak Amendame, the imagination, what it does is it retains those images and also could combine those images. So you can imagine a, an elephant with wings because you have a picture in your mind of an elephant and you have a picture of wings. And what the imaginative, imaginative faculty does is it puts together images and breaks them apart and does all sorts of funny things. And it does that in your dream. It does that even when you're asleep. That's what dreams are. Just mixing up images that are stored in your brain. Um, and that's what the, why the Rambam insisted that it's not part of the rational aspect of being human. 
because it operates when you're asleep as well. And not only that, it's also not part of the mind. In other words, if someone has a good imagination, someone has a good imagination, well, let's say, what does it mean he has a good imagination? We could talk about that in two ways. Either he's very, he's capable of imagining, he's quick to imagine um, interesting images. And that would be one way to talk about someone who has a good imagination. And a more important way, which we're going to talk about today, really, is that he also is capable of conjuring images that are meaningful. That would be another thing to think about someone who has a good imagination. Like someone who's a good artist. So besides the fact that he's capable of painting, that's a skill. Maybe that's part of the Kaychasichli, whatever that is the skill of painting, of executing his art, but the fact that he's able to think of art, so he's doing two things. He has imagination, he's able to manipulate images, but he's also able to manipulate images in a meaningful way to the extent that his art represents something. So the question is, essentially, why wouldn't that be a human quality or human excellence? Why wouldn't you say, okay, you know what? Someone might have a Milo, that his imagination operates very well. And I'm going to let the Ramah speak for himself, for himself before you, before I even consider this question to be finished. The question is really, because of what this question is bringing us to, is Nevoa. And another way to ask the same question is in the following way. Here the Ramah says, in the Mordebuch and Chilik Beis Perek Lamed Vav, here's where he defines what Nevoa is. The essence of Nevua is a Shefa from Hashem that hits a person's intellect. And then from there, it hits his Koyachamadana. And this is the highest level a person could reach. And the Spitz Shlemus that the human species could reach. So the highest level that the human species could reach, says the Rambam, is when the imaginative faculty is influenced by truth. And this, in one sentence, is the Rambam's definition of Nabu. Okay, so everything that we need to know about Nabu, well, not everything, but a synopsis, a summary of what you need to understand, know about the Rambam's Nabu for the purpose of today's share is this sentence. What is Nabu according to the Rambam? Nivua means like this. A human being has imagination. Part of being a human being. A human being also has intellect. Sometimes there's this flow of information of seichel which goes into a person's seichel and then impacts and affects his imagination. So what happens is like this. The Ramam's marriage in this parak. But basically what happens is like this. A person who's consumed with the truth and thinks about, constantly thinks about the important and true things, plus he has a very good imagination, a very healthy imagination. See, a healthy imagination, that's a natural thing. Some people have better imaginations than others. But someone who has a very good imagination and he's consumed with the MS, what's going to happen is especially when he's asleep and he's not thinking, there's going to be the subconscious effect on his imagination, which means, in simple terms, there are going to be images that appear in his mind. Images, what kinds of images will appear? Those images that match or that represent the truths that are flowing down to his intellect. Okay? This is Ram's definition of of um, of Nebua. and Ram says explicitly that this is the highest level of human being, and the complete, the most shlemus that can be in the human species. So why then would the Ram and Prakim not say that if you want to talk about a person having a Milo, one of the Milos says he has a good imagination, and the Ram says it very specifically, very clearly. In the next, in the continuation of Chelik Beis Perek Lamavav over here, that not everyone can reach this level because it's not enough to have Chachma. And it's not enough to have moral perfection. 
you also need a very strong and healthy imagination. One says explicitly. So if we talk, and, and so in order, so you want to say, oh, the perfect man, here the Ramadan defines, what's a perfect man? Perfect man has to have three things. He has to have a good intellect. He has to have good character. But he's still not a Navi, unless he also has good imagination. Ram says, Mefurish, that lets you have a person later in the parak, lets you have a person who does not have a good imagination. He just poor imagination. But he has a very good head and a very good midas. He won't be a Navi. He will be a wise man. And I'll have a lot of things to teach if from the perspective of wisdom. But he will not see images that are mishalim for truth. Because the essence of Nebuah is, is bound with mishalim. And mishalim is the function of the imaginative faculty. Why? Because the imaginal faculty does not perceive truth. The imaginal faculty just dabbles, engages in images. But if those images are reflective of truth, because you have a person here who's consumed with the truth and only cares about the truth, while at the same time he has a very powerful imagination. So his imagination is going to then be impacted by the truth that is on his mind, then that's what Nabu is. That's what Nabu is. So how could the Ramam then leave out this perfection from Parag Bay's of Srinath Prabhupada? Okay, that's the question. Now, to clarify, we're going to go back to this parak to some of it. There's a lot to learn from Felix Bay's parak Lamed Vav regarding today's shear. But first, I want to just clarify: the imaginal faculty in and of itself is not a human, not a specifically human uh, power. This is what Ram says in a couple of places in the Marty book. One of them is here in Chelik Gimel Parak Memches, where he says this is where he talks about Tami Hamistus in the Marty Bukim. Chile Gimel, Perik, uh, I forgot, whatever, something till the end. He talks about till, till I'm sorry, till um, Perik Memtes. He talks about Tami HaMitzvahs. And in this Perik, he says, you know why you're not shecht oisav as b'noi b'yamechon? Because if you slaughter the baby in front of the mother, it's going to cause tremendous pain to the mother. Why? There's no difference, says the Rambam. Amazing thing. Amazing thing. There is no difference in the pain that a human suffers seeing her young being slaughtered in her presence. Um, there's no difference between that and the pain suffered by an animal who has that same experience. Why? Because the love of a mother and his, her pity for a son do not derive from logic. They derive from the imaginative faculty, which most animals have just as humans do. Amazing thing. I can't imagine that this is true. Maybe I'm misunderstanding it. There's got to be something off here. Dharmam seems to be saying that, I mean, he says it, that a, a, a cow suffers as much as a human when its young is slaughtered in its presence. Because the love and the chemla has nothing to do with logic. It has to do with imagination. Now, why does it have to do with imagination specifically? We have to leave that for now. My point is just that the Ramam says that animals have imagination just like humans do. And they have to understand what imagination means. What, what the Ramam says imagination, what does he mean? So, yeah, there's images in their mind. Okay, what does it have to do with... What, what is the fact that there are images in the cow's brain... Right? Do cows dream, for example? I don't know. I wonder if we know that. We probably could figure that out by now, maybe. In fact, I have to my eye into that. But, okay, so there's images in the cow's head. So the, the cow suffers because of these images. What, is, what exactly does that mean? So I want to help you understand here, what does the imagination mean? And then we'll bring it back to, to, to the Perak Bays. But in this in this Maramaka, I'm showing you that in no way does the Ramam hold that imagination is a uniquely human faculty. It's not, okay? That's not what my question is. It's not a uniquely human faculty. But neither is sense, right? Neither is sense. Um, only intellect is uniquely human. Okay, but we'll get back to the question soon. I just want to bring out that it's actually something that the animals have as well. 
And what it is, and this will help you understand a little bit why imagination is what uh, makes an animal suffer. What is dimian? What does the imagination do? Besides what I described before, I described that it just dabbles in images, right? It just has images. But those images that are in your mind, which is the faculty of imagination, are not meaning free. In other words, you don't have like this. You don't have reason, which is thought, plus you have a database of images. That would be beautiful. Life would be very simple. If all we had in our minds were two things, number one, reason, and reason can't be wrong. Logic is logic. Seichel is seichel. Ram holds chachma is chachma. Seichel cannot be wrong. If all we had was seichel, plus we had a bunch of images floating around in our mind that we could stop call on when we want to, then everything would be fine. But things are a little bit more complicated than that because what happens is those the database of images usurps thought. It replaces thought. And that's when we talk about the klecha dimyan, right? Everyone talks about dimyan, dimyan. Use the word dimyan. Dimyan really means imagination, i.e. images, imagination. But the danger of images is not just the fact that we have images in our mind. Who cares? The thing is that we use the, we, we rely on those images as being truth. And really, truth has nothing to do with images. And I'll explain what that means. This parak, chilek alef, parak ayin gimel, the Ramam um, explains, I'll let him speak for himself. He says, you know that most animals have dimyan, so we saw before. And all animals that have a heart certainly have dimyan. Okay, so we saw before um, most animals have dimyan. Now we know for some reason it has to do with animals that have a heart. So animals that have a heart have dimyan. Okay, interesting. You know, we talk about the heart being the place of thought. According to the Ramam, the heart and imagination do in fact go together. Demian, imagination, is not what makes a person unique. What the imagination does is not what the intellect does. It's rather the opposite. What the imagination does is the opposite of what the intellect does. Because what the intellect does is it, it breaks things down. What the intellect does is analyzes things. It could take one thing and say, well, what is this? So let's you take an item. And you say, ah, this is matter plus form. That's only in your mind. That's in your, I'm sorry, that's to say that's through your intellect, through your reason. And that can make you understand what something really is and what its causes are. And it could take one thing and understand from that one thing many ideas. And Seichel also could tell you the difference between a general thing and a specific thing. Okay, fine. While dimming doesn't do anything like that. The dimmian only understands the thing itself, the total thing itself, as it's perceived by the senses. So this is the key point. Seichel, reason takes a thing, one item. Now, one item is not really one item. Why? Because one item is really flamer, tsura, it could have color, it could have its essence, it could have its accidents, like what color is it? Is it what size is it? Is it hot? Is it cold? Those are all um bunch of different data points about what we call one thing and the intellect the reason can take one thing and make you understand that there's really a whole bunch of different facts over here while dimyan only relates to the thing as it's perceived by the senses so dimyan takes the thing as it happens to appear and that becomes truth for the dimyan or what the dimyan can do is it could combine things that are separate And the dimyan, this is the key point, this is a very key point, dimyan cannot avoid matter in its asaga. Dimyan cannot avoid matter. So dimyan follows senses. Dimyan is what takes the objects of senses as being real and true. And objects of senses are always material. And that's where the Ramam ends by saying, you cannot use your dimyan to actually realize the truth. Ramam says, furthermore, in the whole Sefer, that according to the dimyan, Hashem is a guf. Because the dimyan cannot relate to anything that's disembodied. That's what it says over here, that the dimyan cannot avoid matter. Because what dimyan does is it takes images and says, okay, that's the thing. And it doesn't, it doesn't, um, 
analyze the image for its logical components. Okay, that's the nature of the image. Any questions? Okay. Okay, so getting back to the question I have on Peric Base, um, the dimming is a dangerous thing. In other words, we don't want you to um, think that your dimming is true. The dimming is something that is shared with animals as well. Also, going back to Peric Lamedvav, the Ramam says that uh, to be a Navi, you have to have a very healthy intellect. And if you don't, if you're not born that way, there's nothing you could do about it. Nothing you could do about it. And therefore, not everyone could be a Navi. So I'm talking about a faculty of the soul, which is Something that animals have as well. Something that you can't train. You're either born with it or you're not, or, or not. But nonetheless, nonetheless, given that the Ramam says that in order to be a perfect human being, as he says, the perfect human being has a good dimin as well. So if, so if we have a big problem, why is that not part of the Milo Anushis? So, for example, Milo Sikhli is what are the Milo's that a human being can have? Milo Sikhli is Milo Medusius. Milo Medus, he could train. Milo Sikhli is some of them depend on his nature, on being born with a good intellect. Okay, but nonetheless, the two of them, if you have Milo Sikhli and Milo Medusius together, you are a perfect human being. But now we know there's a third component. To be a perfect human being, you have to have. You have to have a healthy and strong in, um, imagination as well, because only then can you be a Navi, which is to say someone whose intellect um, gets true images. If that's the case, why would you not? Why would that not be part of what makes uh, a human being have minus? That is my question here on Peric Base. And the truth is, okay, I want to just read, you know, I want to go back a step here. I don't just read this, this paragraph here, Nechilek Beis Perek Lam Avav, just so it should be very clear to you what Nevuah is, according to the Rambam. He says, a person who you could describe this way, and the description that he gave earlier is that I have a person who's very wise and very virtuous in his morals, and always consumed with thinking about Hashem and not busy with animalistic things, undoubtedly, when his imaginative faculty is active, like when he's asleep, and his imaginative faculty is very perfect, so he's going to receive a shefa from the seichel, according to how perfect his mind is, because he perfects his mind. So what's he going to think about? What's he going to see? What's he going to dream about? He's going to dream about godly things. And all he's going to see in his dreams is Hashem and his malachim. And he's going to know truths. So, Nevuah and the Rambam is basically a natural thing. We're going to get to this soon. Basically a natural thing that if your Koyach HaMedame is perfect, you have a very healthy imagination, and your mind and your midas are focused on Hashem, that's what your Koyach HaMedame is going to see. So why does that not contribute to the human Shlemos? This is my question. And I mentioned this in the last year, that Aristotle himself, who's the one who started this whole idea about something that happens when you're asleep, is not part of what it means to be a perfect human. So he says like this, this faculty are part of the soul's magnetic during sleep. When they are asleep, you cannot tell a good man for a bad one. Right? We're looking to say, what's a Mila? Mila means this is a good person. So like the Aristotle, look, the Kirch Madam operates when you're asleep. And when a person is asleep, good and bad are the same. And he brings a saying that for half their lives, there's no difference between happy and miserable because when you're sleeping, everyone's the same. 
But then he says, and he says, why is that the case? Because sleep is the cessation of the soul from the functions on which goodness depends. depends. Sleep is when your soul stops doing the things that determine whether it's good or bad. Except, says Aristotle, that in some small degree, certain of the sense impressions may reach into the soul during sleep. And consequently, the dreams of the good are better than those of ordinary men. So Aristotle acknowledges the fact that good people have better dreams than ordinary men. But then he says, okay, we're not going to go into this further. Let's leave this alone. But there is something that happens to good people when they're sleeping. Good people have better dreams. In other words, who is more likely, says Aristotle, to have a dream that's, that's meaningful and good? A good person. And that's essentially leading into this question. The Ram describes Navua as the person who's capable of having good dreams because he has a good imagination. And his dreams are going to be completely informed by the truths about God and the angels and everything that he's consumed with in his mind. So boom, so then you do have a, a, a human perfection that is manifest in the imaginative faculty. So why does Rama leave that out? Okay, now the answer essentially is the following. We'll see how much of this we can pursue. It's a very complicated subject. I want to just tell you the, the core answer and then we'll see how much we can explore this in the Rambam. This really could be the subject of a numerous room, five room probably, if we really pursue this properly. It's not so important for the Shwena Prakim, so I'm just going to treat it in this year. Um, so I want to tell you the core answer, and then we'll see how much we can see within the Rambam's writings. The answer is as follows. The fact that... According to the Rambam, the fact that a person with a very strong imagination will imagine things, will have images in his mind that reflect truth and that are contain important messages, that's what Nebuah is. The fact that that happens does not derive from human perfection. It does not derive from human perfection. In other words, it's not by virtue of the essence of a human that he'll imagine true things. Rather, and this will have to be explored to the best we can, rather it's sort of a gift from heaven, somewhat akin to a miracle, that a person who is um, who uh, described, such as we described, will also imagine things that reflect the truth. So again, the key point is that although it's true, although it's true that certain people have Nevuas and certain people don't, and that those people who have Nevuas only will have Nevuas because they have very healthy imaginations. That's all true. However, nonetheless, nonetheless, that the person who has a very good imagination is not considered a better person because that perfection, the perfection of being able to have Nebua, does not derive from the essence of being a human. It's rather something that's, we can call it added to being a human or connected to being a human. Now, that maybe is a little bit cryptic. So let's dive into the sources, but I wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of what the answer is going to be. So in other words, you think about, okay, what's the human being, right? We've been talking about this and starting from Parakal. What's a human being? So we say the answer is, according to the Rambam, human being is essentially his intellect and his the things that share an intelligence. The fact that the imagination could respond to intelligence, the fact that the imagination could also reflect truth is not something that's inherent to the nature of a human being, to the intellect. It's rather something external to the human being. It's like he has an animal. Remember, we've been learning the fact that the intellect, that the that the imagination is shared with animals. So it's like the human being has an animal that he carries around. That's his imaginative faculty, and that animal, for perfect human beings, starts acting in a way that's interesting because you can you can use the images of the animal, animalistic self, to reflect truth and to say mishalim and to say nevuas, and that's wonderful, very very important, but. It's not the human, it's not the essence of the human being. Of course, working against this, how could I say it's not the essence of the human being if the first sentence we saw is that it's 
the, the highest shlemas that could be in the human species. Sounds like it's clearly the perfection of the human. Okay, so that's something I have to explain to you. Besides for explaining what this all means, we have to get back to that sentence. So in order to understand this, what we have to do is we have to jump into Chelik Beis, Perak Lama Beis, and Buchim, which is... Um, okay, I started saying it, so I'll continue saying it. I was going to say it's one of the most difficult prakim, but you can't say that because that's true about so many prakim. So, and one of the most interesting prakim, also true about so many prakim. Uh, but what we're going to do is the following. Well, briefly, like I said, now it's going to be a little bit of a quicker pace because to do this whole topic justice will be is impossible for the one year. So, and I want to just really get to the key point that's relevant to us. So we'll go through this very quickly, but it's going to, it might be hard, to, hard to, to follow. Somewhat hard to follow. I'll, I'll try to do my best. The problem with this parak tells you people's opinions about prophecy. There are three opinions. Most people, and this is a foolish opinion, the Ram says, that some people, some Amaratsim, believe. They say that Navu is completely miraculous. God chooses who he wishes from among human beings and sends them. Doesn't matter if the person was wise or ignorant. Okay. Second opinion. So that's the first opinion is the essence of prophecy is a miracle where God just selects someone and tells them what to say. Now, we already learned Chilik Beis Perek Lam Avav, whether I'm explaining to us what it is. As you'll see, that sounds more like the second opinion here, but let's be patient. The second opinion is the opinion of the philosophers. And that opinion is that prophecy is a certain perfection in human nature. And this perfection requires training, like all perfections. And not everyone could have a perfection. Only some of them will. That's the way it is with all perfections. There's a bell curve. According to this opinion, so what's the opinion of the philosophers? That prophecy is a certain perfection, human perfection. The first opinion is that it's miraculous. God chooses someone and tells them something. The second opinion is that it's something about human nature. And this is the philosophical opinion, that it's um, human nature. You can't be a fool. You won't go to sleep at night without being a Navi and wake up in the morning. You're a Navi because it's a process. It's a process of perfecting yourself. If you have a perfect person who has all the intellectual and the, the moral virtues, well, most of them, they're all in Paragzion. If Shona Prakram says you don't have to have all of them, you have to have most of them. Plus, you have to have a good imaginative faculty. And he prepared himself. He definitely will be misnabi. Hechrich shali isnabi. According to the philosophers, it's natural. It follows because it's a natural perfection. And according to this opinion, it's impossible that a person should be worthy of prophecy and not prophesy because it's natural. Okay? First opinion, God selects someone and makes them a Navi. Second opinion, it comes from within um, part of human nature of human, human perfection. It's a rare human perfection, just like most perfections are rare, but it is human perfection. The third opinion, which is the Das of Aratoira, is Bidiyuk, like, this, like the philosophical opinion, except for one aspect. We believe, says the Rambam, that someone who's worthy of Nebua and prepared himself for it might still not be Misnabe. And that's because God might not want him to be misnabe. And that, in my opinion, says the Ramam, is like all miracles and acts the same way. Naturally, if you're worthy of it, worthy meaning your, your body, your, 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 your nature is allows for prophecy, you will prophesy. If you don't, it's like someone's hand was miraculously paralyzed. Like Yeravam, when he was Maktir on the Mizbeh. Or someone was uh, blinded, like the army of Malaharam. So the Rambam says like this. The third opinion, which is the opinion of the Torah, is exactly like the second opinion of the philosophers, except for one aspect, which is that 
even though a person is worthy of nevuah, he might miraculously be deprived of it. Of it. Okay? So the third, three opinions are. The first one says, Hashem is menami, a person, boom, just Hashem does it. Second opinion is, we do it. It's all, it all comes from ourselves. Third opinion is like a little bit of a combination. We can do it, but Hashem may withhold it from us. And that's a miracle. Now, the problem with this is, there are a few problems. The most fundamental problem is, how is this a third opinion? How is this a third opinion? If we believe in Nisim, then yes, the same way Hashem might paralyze someone's arm miraculously, doesn't mean that arms don't move naturally. Arms move naturally, but Hashem might paralyze an arm. Okay, so Nivu is natural. And yes, Hashem might make an ace. It's like saying, let's say you'd say like this, Machloik is how do people move their arms? Some people say whenever a person wants to move his arm, an angel, um, it's a nace. Hashem makes his arm move. Some people say Hashem gave us the nature to move our arms. Third opinion is Hashem gave us the nature, but Hashem might paralyze. It's not a third opinion. It's, it's, it is the second opinion. You just happen to hold of miracles. And the philosophers happen not to hold of miracles, which maybe is true. Philosophers might not hold of miracles because Aristotle probably didn't hold of miracles. Aristotle didn't hold of miracles. So maybe these philosophers, the Ram quotes, are Aristotelians, don't hold of miracles. But that's a Zaytik of because that's nothing to do with Nevoa. Why is Ram giving three opinions on Nevoa? Maskim, Moshe Mordechai, Hidakasha? Why is he making the three opinions? That's one question. The Chaira, the Das Torah is that Nevoa is natural. It happens to be that Hashem can make a nice. That's one Kasha. Another Kasha is that the Ramam says the following. So in order to support the third opinion that, yes, it's natural, it comes from your nature, but Hashem could withhold it. So first he brings sources that uh, to be another, you have to prepare for it. And then he brings sources to show that sometimes people prepare for it, but nonetheless don't say Nebuah. And he brings a source from Baruch. Okay. And he says, well, maybe you could be mad for that source. Okay. However, we find many expressions, some of them in the Mikra and some of them in the Chachamim, that all follow this Yesoid, Shehakel menabei as mishehu chafetz, kishehu chafetz. That Hashem inspires with prophecy whoever he wants, when he wants. So that's a raya that Hashem sometimes withholds it. The way the Rama presented it, it's not that like the first opinion that Hashem does it. It really comes from nature. Just like moving your arm, just like using your eyes comes from nature. Just like using your eyes and moving your arm can sometimes miraculously be withheld. So do prophecy can miraculously be withheld. But here the Rama says that we have many sources that prove that Hashem could withhold it. The Rama says because we have many sources that say that Hashem is menambe who he wants, when he wants. Well, why is the second opinion, why is the third opinion, I'm sorry, why is the third opinion described as Hashem is Menabe, who he wants, when he wants, if it's merely that Hashem can withhold it from us? And the final question on um, this, on the simple presentation of the third opinion about Nebuah, which is that it's natural, but Hashem withholds it, is that the Ram has a very important rule this is in Chelekim and Periklam base. And his rule is that although all miracles change nature, the nature of the human being, Hashem will never change. Very important rule to the Rambam, which he bases on the Pasuk. Hashem says, oh, if only the people would fear me forever. If Hashem is looking, who can do this for me? Why can Hashem do it himself? Because Hashem does not change human nature. That's why Hashem gives us mitzvahs, says the Ramah. Because he doesn't just make us do the right things. That's not how Hashem operates. Because he lets us do what we would and perfect ourselves as we would. And he doesn't intervene. And the question then is, how could the Ramah then say 
that the highest perfection available to man, which is prophecy, Hashem sometimes withholds. Hashem doesn't miraculously intervene in human nature. So I want to tell you the side, and like I said, I really, with this whole discussion, requires a much lengthier, um, lengthier analysis. We have to be brief over here. This is something which I think is going to touch, I think we spoke about this in the past. And the, idea, the central idea is here in Chilik Beis Perak Lamed, where the Rambam says that man is in a certain sense dual and a certain sense one. Now, Chilik Beis Perak Lamed, I'll explain to you what that means in a minute. Chilik Beis Perak Lamed, the Rambam is talking about Masa Bereshis. That's the Perak where the Rambam analyzes Masa Bereshis most explicitly. It's a very cryptic Perak. Here he's talking about man and woman. Man and woman, in a certain sense, are two, in a certain sense, are one. And this is, of course, the Chazals, about Adam and Chava being created as one, being divided. Are they really one entity? Are they two entities? The Ramam says that Zohar and Ikeva are, in a certain sense, one, in a certain sense, two. And what that means is, Zohar represents, the male represents the intellect, the Ramam says. And the female represents matter. Or you can say Chomer and Surah. Right, because the form of the human being is his intellect. So now we have a question: Is a human being made up of two things, or is a human being one thing? That means, and this is something that we've been really dealing with a lot. What is a human being? Is a human being a composite? Is a human being his intellect, or is a human being a composite of intellect and matter? So with the, 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 the secret of Maisa Baratius, when we have all these chazals and this took him about, is are man and woman one or are man and woman two? The mushal, the nimshal of that is, this whole strange thing that the human being is an intellect connected to a body, are we supposed to look at that as one thing? Um, in other words, human being has, has somehow has two different parts. One is intellect and one is material. Or is the human being really the intellect? And the matter, the body, is not part of the human being. And the answer the Ram says is they're both true. You could look at the human being in two different ways. You could look at the human being as being defined purely by his intellect. And you could also look at the human being as being a composite of um, a material and, and intellectual component. So there are two ways to look at the human being. Okay. Now, going back to um, this whole business on the Buah. And this is the key point. We've learned that really imagination is not inherently a human faculty. Really, animals have the same imagination, and animals suffer just as much as human beings do, um, based on their imagination, right? Because like, as we learned in Gaelic, Aleph, Perak, and Gimel, when we talk about imagination, we don't just mean that you have an image in your mind, but that image is what you understand as being true as being the most real thing, because you don't extrapolate like the intellect does. The intellect breaks something down, analyzes it, and figures out what's the truth of the thing. Imagination takes whatever presents to the senses as being absolute. Okay. That is inherently an animalistic thing, something that human beings share with animals as well. Nonetheless, the Ramam told us in the beginning of the base paragraph above that the most perfect human beings also have these perfect imaginations that reflect the truth. So to say that the most perfect human being has an imagination in his service, that's true from the perspective of treating a human being as composite as someone who has intellect and matter as well because you remember that the imagination always uses matter imagination is saying is basically it's how you could look at it this way imagination the Rambam is how matter thinks right what thought okay thought is logic ah but you know what? Matter also has this weird way of thinking. It doesn't think in logical terms. It thinks in material terms, in tangible, sensory terms. Whatever it senses, that's what's real. Whatever it sees, that's what's real. 
So that's what imagination is according to Ram. Dimin is the way matter thinks. Now, is the human being material? Well, you can look at the human being as being material as well. So now, but you call maybe yeah, maybe no. There are two aspects. There are two ways to look at the human being, as he said in Chelik Beis Perak Lamed. And this idea that there are two ways to look at the human being, this is key to understanding the Mar Nebuchim. In a certain sense, it's the big thing the whole Mar Nebuchim is about. Because the Mar Nebuchim wants us to think about Hashem not as having a guf. That's a big avoid of the Rambam in the Mar Nebuchim. is to de-anthropomorphize Hashem, which is a function of the dimyan. On the other hand, the Mar Nebuchim also trains us supposed to train people how to be Nevi'im, which is how the Dimyan can then teach us things about Hashem. So there's a dual, there's a duality within the Mar Nebuchim about the human being. On the one hand, the human being is supposed to be completely transcend his material self, which includes his Dimyan. On the other hand, um, on the other hand, some human beings are capable for their Dimyan to respond to the intellect and 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 put up these images that reflect truth and those are Nevi'im. So when the Ramam says that the Shleimus Anushi is to be a Navi, that's from the perspective of looking at a human being as being a composite, a hybrid, intellectual and physical being. So then wait a second. Oh, I have matter. I have a, I have a material aspect to myself. The material aspect of myself means I have an imagination. My imagination is going to think as imaginations do. So I'm only perfect if my imagination thinks, to borrow a word, it's not really thinking. Imaginations don't really think, but we, we call it thinking. But it, only if my imagination thinks true things, meaning only if it engages with, with matter, with reality, with pictures, in a way that's reflective of truth. Ah, so that's a Shlema Sanushi. But if you look at human beings as being purely intellectual, then the imagination, which is actually a, an animalistic thing, is not part of the um, totality, of, totality of the human being's perfection. So going back to Chelek Bey's, Perak Laman Bey's, and the questions I asked before, I want to just answer those questions and then bring it back to Shemir Prakim um, and bring back to the, to the answer we're trying to get to. The third opinion is that Hashem is that Nevuah is part of human nature, but sometimes Hashem withholds it. So the question was, well, how can Hashem withhold it if it's part of human nature? Hashem doesn't intervene with human nature. And the other question was, then why is it a third opinion? So now the answer is as follows. Because the second opinion is essentially that Nevuah is human perfection. The third opinion is qualifying that. It's saying like this, you know what? If Nuvua was human perfection, unqualified, in other words, absolutely. If that's true, if there's no other way to look at it, then Hashem would never withhold it because Hashem doesn't do need him to intervene with human beings. When the third opinion says, yes, Nuvua is human perfection, but Hashem nonetheless might withhold it miraculously, what that means is essentially Nivua both is and isn't part of human perfection. Because if it was part of human perfection, unqualified, Hashem would never withhold it. When Hashem does withhold it, that must mean that he's not considering it part of human perfection. How could that be? Because the human being itself can be viewed in two ways. The human being can be viewed as incorporating his body, in which case it is part of human perfection. But a human being can also be viewed as not incorporating his body, in which case, Nivua is not a component of human perfection because Nivua involves the dimyan, which is the body. I want to say one last thing about this and then bring it back to how, just to make it clear how I'm answering the original question. <clears throat> the Ramam in Chilik Beis Perak Lamed Vav, when he talks about um, the virtues that a Navi has to have, so he says he has to focus only on knowing the, the secrets of reality. And his mind always has to turn to the lofty things. And he doesn't care. He stops thinking about animalistic things. Eating, drinking, and beer. In general, says the Rambam, he has to completely not care about the sense of touch, all those pleasures that have to do with touch. 
Because Arist as Aristotle says, that that sense is a cherpa, is a, is a disgrace for us, because we have it as animals and has nothing humanistic. Okay? Now, he says this is a little bit off topic, but it's still important for us because many wise people, they always think about the, the pleasures of touch and they desire it. And they still wonder why they're not prophets if, if Nebu is natural. So the Rambam here, these people are wondering how come they're not Nebuim. And meanwhile, they're busy with type animalistic desire. So it's important to understand that enough he has to avoid animalistic desire. Okay. Now, question. These guys who are wondering why they're not Nevi'im, maybe Hashem is withholding it from them. The Ramam holds that Hashem withholds it as a miracle. So what's the big kasha? Why they're not Nevi'im? Kasha number one. Kasha number two. How come these guys don't understand this Arist Aristotelian Yisoyed that the sense of touch is a disgrace for us? Why don't they all know that? So, Mashenir Pashit is like this. If you think that Nevua is natural, like the philosophers think, meaning to say, it's part of what it means to be human is to be a, a Navi. What that means is that part of what being part of what it is to be human is to have a perfect body, because Nevua is associated with the Dimyan, which is associated with the body. So therefore, you cannot transcend the body. You can't hold like Aristotle that says bodily things are a disgrace because you hold that Navua is natural. Navua being natural means to say that part of a human being perfecting himself is that he perfects his body as well. So if you perfect your body as well, then not rejecting the body. It's only that we who hold that Hashem may or may not give Navua, well, why? Why might Hashem withhold Navua? Because the body is not necessarily part of the human being. Ah, so that tells us something about how we're supposed to live our whole lives in general. It's supposed to tell us that the bodily aspects of ourselves are not so interesting. Okay, I want to bring it back to Shrein Prakim. And with this, I'll end. So the answer to my question, the question we started with was, here the Ramam says that if someone has a good imagination, then he's the most, the highest level human being. So why then is it not part of the Milas and Anushas? Now we have an answer. Because in order to become a Navi, a person has to ignore his animalistic side. Part of the animalistic side that you have to ignore is the Kareh HaDimin itself. You cannot engage with the Kareh HaDimin. As we mentioned earlier, the, a lot of the Mernavukim teaches us not to think about Hashem, Dimin ways, which is exactly what the Naviim do. But the Naviim do that not because they're engaging with the Kareh HaDimin. Remember, the Ramam insists that this is nothing you can't train yourself in the Kareh HaDimin. There's nothing that you can do as a human being about this. Some human beings are gifted with their animalistic self, which includes the Karadimian, in being responsive to their human self, which is their intellect. And those people have this gift of not just being intellectual beings, but also being physical beings. Not everyone is, is a physical being, and that's okay. Because there's one aspect of human being that we don't look at him as being a physical being. We look at him as being purely intellectual. So therefore, Perik Bey's Nishmer Prakim, which is about a person who wants to be virtuous and wants to be, let's, we mentioned before, Afarabi says, what's a mile of something that we praise people for? We don't praise people for having good Kerechadimi. Because that is not, according to the Ramah, because that is not something that a person could cultivate, not a person, something that a person should cultivate. And if a person does have a good Kareh HaDimin that then is respond, responds to his sikhli and he becomes a Navi, that's not something that he's doing. In fact, he has to transcend Dimin, he has to transcend body. It's something that's going to happen to him. And it's akin to as if Hashem is choosing. Remember we said that Lush in the Chilik Beis, Perek Lamed Beis, that what does Ramah mean when he says Hashem chooses who he wants, when he wants, if it's part of your Shlemus. The answer is because not, as we said, not everyone is considered to be a composite. Hashem chooses which person he should consider his body to also be part of his totality of human being. Okay, so I'm going to leave it at that. This is extremely deep ideas, which really require much more understanding in the Ramam's Nebuah. But um, any questions before we shut off the, the recording? Or should, or should we shut it? No questions? Very much. We'll stop the recording.